I want to talk to you tonight on, uh, about something that I think is really critical, and uh, we've um, we've gotten up to it, but we haven't gone through it. Um, I started out uh, on Wednesday from Second Corinthians six fourteen: Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And I, I tried to lay down the reality that that is that is an inviolable divine law that we don't engage in any enterprise or any effort that intends to advance the kingdom of God in connection with unbelievers. And I think that was really clear. Uh, the popular trend is against that. The popular trend is to uh, make as many alliances with uh, uh, unbelieving institutions or unbelieving allies as you possibly can under the um, delusion that somehow you advance the kingdom of God with such alliances. I, I want to see if I can't address that, and especially you're going to find that what I say tonight is going to connect with a lot of things you heard today, and even specifically with some of the things that Steve said in the last session, but I'll leave that connection for you to make, and I don't need to make it myself. The book of worship is the Psalms, so I want you to open your Bible to the Psalms. This is the book of worship, 150 psalms. I, I just want you to look at the opening psalm. Psalm 1 is the gate to worship. Psalm 1 is the gatekeeper. It, it isn't the first psalm that was written, but under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, I believe the psalms are put in this order because Psalm 1 is the gatekeeper. And what Psalm 1 says establishes, establishes the divine expectation for worshipers. As you enter in the gate of the Psalms, this is what you hear. And that is true, the whole, the Psalms, it's, it's good to read the Psalms. There's 150 Psalms, um, and I actually have a little trick that I use to pick out which psalm to read for the day. I haven't done it in a while, but this reminds me of it, and I'm going to continually do that because the Proverbs, we have 31 Proverbs, and we usually have 31 days each month. So with the Proverbs, you can use that system to where read the Proverbs of the day, which today is the 19th. So you'll be reading Proverbs chapter 19, but then the Psalms is 150. So it's a little bit harder to uh, figure out how to read one Psalms per day. Maybe you could just go from from Psalm to Psalm, you know, doesn't matter. Go from one all the way to 150. That'll put you at what? Let me see. Around five months. Every five months, you, you'll start over the Psalms. But it's really good to continually read Proverbs and the um, Psalms. Psalm number one is one of my favorite Psalms as well, including Psalms 23. I like Psalms 37. I like Psalms. What, which is that other one that I like? I know that Psalms 119 is one of the longest chapters in the Psalms and like John MacArthur said, he said that this is like the book of worship, which is, I agree with that. If you read it, it's almost like you just going in worship. That's awesome. So we're, we're listening to this sermon here by John MacArthur, serious worship and unshakable kingdom. Very good, awesome knowledge that he has. And he knows the scriptures. He knows how to divide the word right rightly let me know what you think about john MacArthur in the comment section i'm trying something new right here i usually relax after i've been up since 4 a.m and after uh all the way to around seven ish or eight i tend to take a break i didn't take a break this time and i want to try something new with you guys let me know what you guys think in the comment section I like to play these classic games and just kind of concentrate on a sermon and stuff like that. So I want to share with you guys and and let me know what you think of my gameplay. Because <laughs> I used to be a big time 
gamer, not gamer, but just classic game. I, growing up with a Nintendo and stuff like that. So let me know. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted firmly by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf doesn't wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. That's one kind of worshiper coming through the gate. Here's another kind. The wicked are not so, but they're like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And the thing that you're going to notice with the Psalms is that they're actually made for believers, strictly believers, because God's going to give you insight of the difference between the believers and the unbelievers. So if an unbeliever were to be reading Psalms 1, hopefully it just brings them to repentance, right? Be like, hey, I want to be a believer. I want to be blessed. So it, no matter what, I, I think it still works both ways. God is saying to the worshipers as they enter the temple, I know who you are. You can't fool me. I know you. You don't belong in the assembly of the righteous. Because you're going to perish. You're among the perishing. This is the gate to worship. God expects worshipers to be true worshipers. God is not honored in the false and hypocritical worship of the wicked. That's from the get-go in the Psalms. Any effort to amalgamate the righteous and the wicked in an act of worship is a foundational violation of God's expectation for what worship is. This psalm is there at the gate to stop the wicked from entering worship. And the Lord knows the righteous, and He knows the wicked, and the wicked will perish. This was a stunning reality for the Jews as they came to worship. Do an inventory. Do you belong here? Psalm 2, really another sort of gatekeeper psalm, points in verse 11 of Psalm 2. We'll just look at that. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. So you come in with reverence, you come in with trembling, and you do homage to the sun. Isn't that amazing that it's all the way back at the beginning of the Psalter? And you do homage to the sun. Literally, you bow to the sun. Literally, you kiss the sun. Literally, you prostrate yourself on the ground and kiss his feet in submission to him, or he will be what? Angry and you may die on the spot. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. So Psalm 1 and 2, welcome to worship. This is not come one, come all. This is how you are to worship. This is how you are to approach worship. And by the way, the Lord knows who are His. The Lord knows who are His, of course. 2 Timothy 2.19, the Lord knows those who are His. The Lord knows those who are His. John 10, several times, I know my sheep, I know my sheep. And because the Lord knows who are His, he will make a distinction. Listen to that distinction in the words of Peter in Peter 2. 
God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by destruction, to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then, and this is the point, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation or trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. God sorts everybody out. God knows who the true worshipers are. And, and we, that, that's the thing. We have to make that effort and seek the scriptures. We have to get some time on some time for ourselves to seek the Lord, to worship the Lord. A lot of people are always making assumptions about God without the word of God. That's the thing. So we have to know the word of God to know God. Once you, once you are saved because of the gospel, the gospel comes to you. That, that should be the first thing that comes to you. You might hear a certain sermon that doesn't share the gospel with you. But through that sermon, hopefully, or even you being curious, you, you go and seek and you're going to come across the gospel. The gospel is what's going to save you. That's what's going to save you. And that's going to seal you for eternal life. Shirley, glad that you can join. <laughs> Shirley says, I just got here and I love this for your information. <laughs> nice. I never saved the princess, the biggest shame in my life. <laughs> you better repent for that, Shirley. <laughs> but I was always the cool babysitter who knew the tricks for hundreds of extra lives. Nice. Oh, then, you know what's up, Shirley? Now I got more respect for you now. <laughs> Maybe there was a recollection of someone in the mind of our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount. Turn to Matthew 7. And verse 13, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Just a brief comment, there are more people on the religious road to hell than on the right road to heaven. There are the many and the few. Down in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And that's the thing. Um, and knowing that a lot of people are always trying to save everybody. Like they, they even get in trouble, like teachers, evangelists, preachers. Hey, broad is the road to destruction and narrow is the road to eternal life so there's only going to be a few that find it and god doesn't want nobody to perish but at the end of the day he knows our hearts he knows our flesh he knows our intentions he knows how stubborn we are so there's going to be more that go to destruction than to heaven God didn't want the lawless and unrighteous in his temple. He doesn't want them in his heaven. They don't belong in worship. I wonder 
in this particular form of evangelical today, if we aren't producing some Broadgate Baptist churches, the first Broadgate Baptist church of whoever, wherever, maybe even some Broadgate Bible churches, We've been talking about the gospel. We all understand that. And you heard a classic message from Steve on preaching the Word. And in that message, he came down to verse 5. And I'm going to pick up the baton at verse 5 on do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. I think that means evangelize your church. And if you go back to Psalm 1, you know, God was saying that the crowd that came in to worship Him in the temple, side by side stood the righteous and the wicked. And it was the same in Judaism of the time of our Lord. There were those uh, on the way to perdition and those on the way to glory. They were all there gathered in the temple. And you'll notice as Steve commented on 2 Timothy 4, do the work of an evangelist is the only way that you can complete your ministry. How many pastors are trying to make their congregation feel good when they ought to be feeling terrified? That's true. Because they're scared. That term, fulfill your ministry, in 2 Timothy 4 5, is a compound verb that means to fully accomplish. Romans 4 21 uses it and it says, Abraham was fully assured that what God had promised he was able to perform. Colossians 4 12 uses the same verb to mean fully assured in all the will of God. And Paul even uses it again in 2 Timothy 4, 17, where he says, and this is a summation of his whole ministry, the Lord stood stood with me and strengthened me, that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear. It's a compound word that means to fully accomplish your ministry. And you have not fully accomplished your ministry if you have not, at the beginning, at the door, said, the righteous and the wicked do not belong together here worshiping. I'm good. This is not, of course, to keep them out, but to bring them in through the gospel. I think every time we come to the Lord's table, we need to remember 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves whether you're in the faith. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, I I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, and I'm afraid you're going to be led astray. You're going to be deceived like Eve was deceived. This is part of the reason that I think he says be sober. And you, you pointed that out so strongly. Part of the soberness of pastoral ministry is you just don't take people at face value. That's short-sighted. That's superficial. We have to, in shepherding the sheep, we have to know the condition of the flock. And they have to know their true condition. It was February 9th, 1969. Some of you hadn't even been born, obviously. I came to Grace Community Church on the first Sunday over in the chapel on a rainy day. Stood up and preached my first sermon at this church to a chapel full of happy, expectant people. And I preached on Matthew 7, 13 to 23. And I came out with blazing reality 
letting people know that they may think they're saved, but they may well not be. Why would I do that? Because I grew up in the church. I grew up as a pastor's kid. I saw it. I saw the saints and the ain'ts side by side. And, if, and I was close enough because I was seeing the whole thing through my father's eyes to know that maybe, surely, far more people than we ever thought were lost in the church. Any cursory examination of a quote-unquote evangelical survey will tell you that at least 50% of the evangelicals don't even know what the gospel is. So how do we help our people to know whether they're genuinely converted? We can preach the word Adam and preach the word Adam, but by what criteria do we evaluate their spiritual condition and help them to see it? That's a vital part of pastoral ministry. The Ten Commandments? Last Sunday, I preached on Ephesians chapter 4, and I, I honestly, I can't let go of it, so go back there. Ephesians chapter 4. This is a good starting point, I think, to help you understand that God puts severe restrictions on who comes to worship Him. And if what you're doing is worshiping Him, those restrictions apply. If you're just holding a rock concert, then that's different. God puts severe restrictions on worship, and it's for the righteous, and it's not for the wicked, and many of them don't know what category they're in, and that's why they show up in Matthew 7 saying, Lord, Lord and they find out they had no relationship with Him. So here is a distinguishing portion of Scripture that will help you and your people do a spiritual inventory. Ephesians 4, 17. Ephesians 4, 17. Let's check it out. All right, the word of the Lord reads, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. Wow. See, so you do have to change your, um, your friends, your company, if you you need to. So this I say, or therefore, I affirm together with the Lord. I love that. That's what preachers do, right? We affirm with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the ethne walk. You don't walk that way anymore in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you laid aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and you are renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You know what salvation does? It takes you from being described as futile in mind, darkened in understanding, excluded from the life of God, ignorant 
hard-hearted, callous, sensual, impure, with greediness. And it makes you righteous and holy. That's how you know the difference. I don't hear much about transformation. I hear a lot about decisions, but that's never the evidence of anything. It's the transformation that is the evidence. God knows His children, and we ought to know His children as well. When Jesus said, I know my own, He also said, my own what? Know me. How do they know that? Because of the transformation of their life. It's not enough to just fire the gospel all the time. You have to bring people to a constant, incessant, honest inventory of their spiritual condition. That's part of shepherding. We should expect that if someone has been regenerated, converted, that they would be transformed. Is that a stretch? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are gone and new things come. And you think, well, yeah, but that's maybe the only verse that says that. Oh, no. No, that, that truth has been around since the Pentateuch. I want to do a little Bible study with you. So um, if you've been going to Andy Stanley's church, dust off your Old Testament. And go back to the thirtieth, the thirtieth chapter of Deuteronomy. I want to tell you what Deuteronomy chapter thirty and verse six says: salvation does. Moreover. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Whoa. He'll circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. Now, wait a minute. That's the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You mean... God will enable us to do that? This is what it said. This is what salvation is. It's when God circumcises your heart, does surgery on your heart, cuts off the diseased part, so that the result is you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. How can you tell when somebody's been transformed? They love the Lord with all their heart and all their soul as much as we can in our fallen limitations. If we have been born again, we love the Lord with all our soul and all our heart. That's, that's what He does. It's not because we drum it up. Something else we do. Verse 8, when the Lord does that, circumcising the heart, you shall again do what? Obey the Lord and observe all His commandments which I command you today. So how can you tell when someone is really a believer? They love the Lord with all their being and they obey. Isn't that what Jesus said? If you love me, what? my commandments. When the prophets revealed the nature of New Covenant salvation, they declared... So as, as the Lord works in you, because He says we are the Lord's worksmanship. So once you are saved and born again, you're a new creation. He works in you that you may love Him with all your heart. And that's why I, you know what? And I, now that I think about it, as you go deeper in the scriptures and gain more, more understanding, 
that's how the Lord is working in your heart. You're renewing your mind. That's how the, the Lord is, is working in your heart so that you may love him with all of it. Because in the beginning, your heart still it, it, it has bad habits. You have bad habits. You, ha you, you have bad company. You have a bad mentality. Right when you're born again, you're not right away brand new in the flesh. Your soul is resurrected. Your soul is, is now awakened, basically. Resurrected. You're alive now. But your flesh is still your flesh. Yes, you might see a, a little bit of a difference in the beginning because of the whole, um, I should say, enlightenment. But you're, you still might do some of the things that are not good before God. So he, 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 he'll continually help you work those things out. That, that way your heart is, is a heart that can love the Lord completely. The same thing. Listen to Jeremiah 11, 4. Listen to my voice. And do according to all which I command you, so shall you be my people, and I will be your God. We're, we're, we're talking about Jeremiah. And the definition there of belonging to God was that you do what he commands. Oh, oh no. That Again, obedience. Mishap. Jeremiah 24, 7. I love this. This is another prophetic Old Testament description of salvation. I will give them a heart to know me, for I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I love this. For they will return to me with their whole heart. If somebody's saved, the Lord gets their whole heart. That's what he says. This is new covenant salvation. Let's look at those blessed new covenant passages. In Jeremiah 31, I know you're familiar with it. 33 and 34. That is so true. Like over my years, I received the Lord. I was born again in 2014. And I've, I've noticed that I love the Lord more and more every year. Every year, I experience a bigger love, like a bigger love and understanding towards Him, more gratitude, uh, thanksgiving, more thanksgiving. Toward, like, it, it, be, it becomes greater and greater. So... And to me, I was thinking maybe because I'm just, I'm learning how, how to walk by faith. I think that's why I now, like, man, the Lord is so good. I'm, every single morning, I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord because of what he has done for me, what he's doing and what he's about to do. And since 2014 till now, I'm continually being enlightened still like, and, and my love becomes greater year after year it's awesome and again because i continually seek the lord because i continually seek the scriptures understanding i worship i pray all that because of that as well right but then there's a scripture where it says he gives you the willingness to do those things as well the will and the to do right there's a scripture where it says he gives you the will and, and the to do according to his will, his purpose for you. It's awesome. This is what God does when he saves, because this is what he's going to do when he saves Israel. This is the covenant which I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. If I'm their God and they're my people, my law is on their heart. And they will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, 
for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. When God forgives and God forgets sin, at the same time, He gives a new heart. And awesome. He writes the law in that new heart. Amen. And it is the law of the new man. This is repeated again in the 32nd chapter of Jeremiah. Uh, please let me know if you guys like these videos, this format here. Hit the like button. That way you, uh, I kind of know which videos you guys like. If you guys like this structure, this format, I'm all for it. I like it because, you know, you kind of just hanging out and still hearing the word of God. I know this is a long sermon. It's an hour, 23 minutes, but it's, it's so good. And you're just listening, right? You're just listening and like a sponge absorbing it. So let me know. Make sure you guys hit that like button. And uh, also don't forget to subscribe if you're new here. Join Faith Makes One Rich. Verse 38, they shall be my people and I will be their God. And I'll give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. There's the doctrine of eternal security in Jeremiah. God totally transforms the inner person. That's awesome. Yeah, um, Shirley says, I like it because I can do other things as well. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, I was going to say, yeah, if you also, if you're here on the live stream, I don't mind you asking questions as well. If you have some kind of question, something that you've been seeking answers to, you can still ask it here on my live stream and I can answer it as well as we hang out together. New heart, new affections, new law, new love. Ezekiel also in the 11th chapter, not as well known, 11th chapter of Ezekiel, Verse 19, the Lord talks about removing all detestable things and abominations. And then in verse 19, again, he describes salvation. Uh, I will give them one heart. I'll put a new spirit in a new law, a new heart, a new spirit. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. They will be my people and I shall be their God. What defines the reality of that relationship is loving God, loving the law of God, fearing God, worshiping God, and walking in joyful obedience. I just don't think that has been communicated to people in this evangelical oh. movement. It's like if you prayed a prayer Sorry, sometime Joshi. or you had an emotional experience or you felt a buzz when somebody talked about Jesus and the cross. That's all it takes. That's not a transformation. In Ezekiel 36, 26, well, 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. So <laughs> this is amazing. The salvation is not just forensic. It is that, but it's not just that. It's an actual cleansing from your spirit. Paul says we're washed by the water of the word, right? Your, your soul it cleanses your soul. I'll clean you up. I'll, I'll get rid of your filthiness and your idols. And then verse 26, the same thing. I will give you a new heart 
and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. That's salvation. I mean, unless you're a dumb dispensationalist and you want to stick that somewhere it doesn't belong. That's salvation. Salvation is transformation. Yeah. Work out your own salvation. Now, let's go back to Ephesians. You've got to renew the mind. So what do we expect salvation to look like? Well, let's look at chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. You were in serious condition. You were dead. That, that's as low as you can go. There's nothing below dead. So the metaphor to describe your condition is the lowest possible concept. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. You're walking. Your conduct is according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the spirit working the sons of disobedience. You are essentially, according to verse 3, living in the lusts of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and are by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You're like everybody. Everybody's like that. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Now, <laughs> this is a monergistic work of God, right? He just took the dead people and made them alive. By grace we were saved, and not only did He make us alive, but He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, we are elevated to the very throne of heaven with Christ, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that you may boast. But look at verse 10, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. Now look at this which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You talk about the sovereignty of God in your salvation, that's the sovereignty of God in your sanctification. Do you know He has foreordained your good works? He has foreordained your life. He has foreordained your preaching, your praying. He has foreordained every expression of love toward Him, every act of worship. He wrote it down before you ever existed. That is true right there. I love that. I love that. And uh, it's very subtle, right? Very subtle. But uh, a lot of times, John MacArthur, he, he, can be, he can be severe as well. There's always a time and place to share with somebody the, sh the word of God in a certain way, shape, or form. Sometimes you're like, you're telling somebody that there's a fire in there, don't go in there. Or there's going to be sometimes when you're pulling somebody out of the fire. So the fire is going to represent hell. Make sure that we understand that, that metaphor in order for us to share the word properly with each other. Okay, so. This was awesome. This was fun. I'm going to go ahead and save it there. And we're, we'll continue there. Also, make sure, don't forget to hit that like button so I can know which videos you guys like and all that fun stuff. But other than that, I'll see you on the next video. You take care. Be safe. God bless you.